Hello and welcome to Workers World Party's webinar, Free Them All, Prisons and COVID-19. My name is Mikasa Matema. Today we'll be speaking about COVID-19, the way it is affecting those who are locked in U.S. prisons and detention centers, and why we say free them all. Right now, as a deadly virus is spreading across the world, millions of people are being held by the U.S. government in unsanitary conditions. In prisons, jails, migrant detention centers, people are packed into confined spaces with no way to practice social distancing. Medicare, uh, medical care for inmates in the U.S. is notoriously inadequate. If someone gets sick, they will be at the mercy of one of the worst healthcare systems in the world. And there's almost no way to stop an outbreak once it starts. This is a death sentence for anyone trapped in the United States mass incarceration complex. That's why Workers World Party demands that we free all prisoners unconditionally and without exception. We understand that there is no justice under capital suppression. The US mass incarceration complex is a system of concentration camps for the poor. U.S. police and courts target people of color to enforce segregation, enrich prison contractors, and protect the wealthy against the righteous anger of the oppressed. This is a system that has to be stopped now. To discuss this, we have a great panel of activists and organizers who have been working in the struggle against mass incarceration and immigrant detention. Before we bring them on, I'd like to introduce my co-host, Leilani. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be co-chairing this panel today, and I really want to thank um, all of our speakers, you know, from the bottom of my heart for um, not only being on the panel today, but for the work that, that you all do um, in your areas to, you know, stop the prison industrial complex, to make the links between um, capitalism and, you know, the system that touches every working person um, in this country. Um, as someone who, you know, also has been has been affected by the prison industrial complex, as someone who had a mother who spent, you know, many years in prison, um, I really want to just offer my heartfelt thanks. Um, I also want to say I'm, I'm living right now in Durham, North Carolina, and here in Durham, we're doing our own organizing, um, long time organizing around um, particularly the jail system here. Um, and tomorrow we're having a uh, car uh, protest, you know, driving, driving to the jail, um, which before COVID um, saw, you know, um, something like a dozen deaths in, in, in over, over the past few years. Um, and we know that those conditions are just gonna um, deteriorate. So again, um, you know, just, uh, I'm, I'm so thankful for the solidarity that's gonna be shown in the room tonight. And, um, you know, just thank all the speakers for, for their work again. Um, so, um, so again, we want, we encourage you, we thank you again. We want to encourage everyone to keep sharing the link to join this webinar on social media. We have a fantastic panel um, and we want to get the word out about the good work that's being done and about, um, and about these issues. Um, you can also share from Workers World Party, our, our page on Facebook or um, at Workers World at, on Twitter. And, uh, Makasi, I believe. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Leilani. Um, so our first speaker is Brian Arroyo. Uh, he's a jailhouse lawyer and writer for Workers World, uh, currently incarcerated in SCI Frackville, Pennsylvania. Uh, Brian recorded this interview last week about the conditions on the inside for the Workers World podcast. So let's listen in. Well, I mean, it, it's definitely a, a, a trying time. And it's one that, you know, I'm just uh, trying to maintain a positive outlook, even though that I do believe that eventually this uh, COVID virus, you know, will spread. You have one minute left. And it's not going to be something that we're going to be able to stop per se. Yeah. But eventually, once everybody either comes across it or, you know, becomes, you know, immune where it can become vaccinated, then that will happen. But this is a new ordeal throughout, not just here, it's unprecedented throughout the system. But I also believe that it also presents a new excitement for the system to revamp its draconian laws and to look at it with a new, fresh perspective because change, you, you know, it's inevitable. We all have to go through a process of change, whether we're reluctant or reticent to do so. So I think that the system now confronts a new monster. It ain't the COVID-19, it's the injustices that have been done to prisoners like myself, men who are actually innocent and those that are deserving of a second chance. Because right now, 
everybody's being tentatively sanctioned to one hour of rent. So we're on total, we're really on death row lockdown. Yeah. Yeah. This is exactly what it is. This is death row lockdown. This is 23 and one, literally. There's no break in between that. There's no nothing extra. Their contingency plan on dealing with a disease or a virus that we're challenged, everybody's challenged with. Uh, we all, all have to face and confront the realization of it. Um, they're just thinking that this is a natural lockdown, the way that they're thinking. And they're not adapting to the fact that when you talk about 30 days of, you know, 23 and one, that's a, that's not a normal lockdown. This is literally a death row lockdown, yeah. which exacerbates mental health. And I think that, you know, the reason that they're doing this is because, to be truthful, <laughs> they don't know how to adapt to the overall big picture. They're just thinking in fragments. They're piecemealing the situation, if you will. Right. And as they go, they are more reactionary. If they would respond to the situation accordingly and listen to exactly what our needs are, this is something that protects them. Because when we as prisoners eat in ourselves and we eat a good meal, that's what we're doing. We're laughing, joking, thinking about our family, discussing our family. Yeah. And going to sleep, right? Yeah. So yeah. You, you go you go to sleep in peace. You're breaking bread accordingly. But they're not doing that. They're not getting that. You don't need any more problems. You don't need people lashing out. You don't need people going ballistic or losing the you know wherewithal of their mind because they're frustrated, because they're starving. So the guys are going off. They went off last night. They're probably going to go off again today because they were trying to deprive them of showers upstairs. They're frustrated. They're locked in. They uh, haven't had their uh, wreck, you know, for their yard out because they get that. They're entitled to, you know, one hour. Yeah. So they all kicked in unison yeah. until they turned around and said, okay, we're going to shower you. So it works. So I mean, the proper thing to all in unison be kicking their doors just to get a shower and, you know, their mealtime and their wreck, you know? Correct. So they, in essence, individually, they all kick their door and they join the party. Yeah. And ain't nobody could go to the door and order them to stop because they're like, fuck you. Yeah. Give me my shit that I deserve. Yeah. And you know that I have a right to. I have a right to a shower. I have a right to wreck. This is not a privilege. You're here to work. Right. You come in here and thinking that you got an attitude. What do, what do you think I have? Yeah. More than an attitude. <laughs> yeah. That's why I'm kicking the door instead of kicking you. Yeah. yeah, listen, speak up and speak out. And remember that you are vicariously our voice from within. And know that no matter what it looks like, this right now is the most scariest and fearful position that any human being could be in. Yeah. Yeah. Make sure you, you state that. I absolutely will. Yeah. But let them know. Uh, so now uh, I'd just like to announce that we're going to be having our next webinar next Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, it's going to be on the May Day General Strike, organizing to shut down capitalism and build workers' assemblies. There'll be more info at workers.org. Uh, we want you to we want to encourage you to donate to Workers World Party so we can keep growing our audience. You can do this at workers.org/donate or on Venmo at, at Workers World. Um, so we're going to hear from our excellent panel tonight on the prison. Um, on the question of prison abolition and our first speaker, well actually our second speaker is Monica Moorhead. Um, Monica is an editor of a great book you can find on our website called Marxism, Reparations and the Black Freedom Struggle. Monica is also a leader of Workers World Party and one of the managing editors of our newspaper. Um, so okay. Monica, thank you. Okay, greetings to everyone uh, and I hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy. Um, 
the most recent article I wrote on racism, COVID-19, and Black people may not speak specifically to the topic for tonight's webinar, but it is very much connected historically and socially. Mass incarceration is nothing new to the US. This brutal policy of social control of workers, especially the white supremacist oppression of people of color, harkens back to the days following slavery with the introduction of the black codes in the deep south before the radical black reconstruction era. Freed black people, especially men, who were demonized as, quote, dangerous and menacing, end, end quote, were forced into semi-enslaved working conditions to be super exploited by former white planters. Michelle Alexander wrote a groundbreaking book in 2010 called The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. It was released during the Barack Obama presidency. This historic election did not change for one iota the second class social status of the black population, those who were born here or those who migrated here. Here's an excerpted description of the black codes which encompassed a number of repressive laws such as vagrancy and convict laws. As explained by the historian William Cohen, quote, the main purpose of the codes was to control the freedmen, and the question of how to handle convicted black lawbreakers was very much at the center of the control issue. Nine Southern states adopted vagrancy laws, which essentially made it criminal, a criminal offense, not to work, and were applied selectively to blacks. And eight of those states enacted convict laws, allowing for the hiring out of county prisoners to plantation owners and private companies. Prisoners were forced to work for little or no pay. One Vagrancy Act specifically provided that, quote, all Negroes and mulattoes over the age of 18, end quote, must have written proof of a job at the beginning of every year. Those found with no lawful employment were deemed vagrants and convicted. Clearly the purpose of the Black Codes in general and the fragrant vagrancy laws in particular were to establish another system of forced labor. In Du Bois's words, quote, the codes spoke for themselves. No open-minded student can read them without being convinced. They mean nothing more nor less than slavery in daily to toil, end quote. Fast forward to 2020. And the legacy of the Black Codes is very much alive with 2.2 million people caged in prisons globally. The, uh, the U.S. still has the largest number of prisoners globally. In 2016, the Bureau of Justice Statistics reported that 35% of state prisoners were white, 38% were Black, and 21% 20 were, were Latinx. For Black people, these are genocidal-like numbers, considering that only 12% of the general population in the U.S. was Black. These conditions have not changed much four years later. And what about the intersection of racial and gender oppressions in prisons? According to the ACLU, Black women represent 30% of all incarcerated women in the U.S. compared to representing 13% of the female population generally. And Latinx women represent 16% of incarcerated women compared to 11% of all women in the U.S. Many are single moms jailed for drug-related and domestic violence offenses. According to a February 2020 a report from NBC News, there are an estimated 5,000 transgender prisoners in state prisons based on the data from 45 states in DC, with a confirmation of only 15 of those states housing prisoners according to their preferred gender. Women and gender oppressed people prisoners face sexual assault and rape on a minute by, by minute basis especially at the hands of st sadistic guards. These st statistics don't really do justice 
to all the horrific injustices happening behind these walls. Although some of these horrors have been uncovered by COVID-19, for instance, the fact that 300 prisoners from Chicago's notorious Cook County Jail have been released due to the spread of the virus. So let's continue to demand to free them all, not only because of the coronavirus, because we want to free the entire working class from the inhumane capitalist system, including those in these concentration camps, build the workers' world. Thanks so much, Monica. Um, our next speaker has been involved in fighting these concentration camps for over 50 years in Texas. Gloria Rubach is an organizer with the Texas Death Penalty Abolition Movement, which fights every execution in Texas, a state that executes more workers than any other. Gloria, you've been fighting mass incarceration for so long. Tell us about why you think this struggle is so critical and why we should free them all instead of, as opposed to just some people. Uh, Gloria, if you're um, if you're speaking right now, you're uh, muted and your camera's off. Okay, sorry about that. Um, we're having a little bit of difficulty. So um, we're gonna go to our next speaker. Uh, Leilani, can you introduce our next speaker? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, before I do that, I wanna say, if you like what you're hearing, we encourage you to go to workers.org and share articles, videos, and other important analysis that you find helpful to our struggle for a better world, where workers are forced to put themselves in danger just to afford a place to live. You can also get workers World articles in your inbox daily by signing up at workers.org. Um, so, so now I'd like to introduce Thelma. Thelma Garcia is an Im immigration attorney in the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. Thelma, you work with clients, migrants detained at the border, all of whom are not guilty of any criminal acts. So why are they being held in conditions that threaten their safety? Can you share your experience with these concentration camps for migrants and tell us more about this prison industry? Certainly, uh, these concentration camps as we all know them to be um, have been in existence quite a few years. I've been practicing here a little over 40 years, and I recall speaking to an, a friend of mine who was about my age, and we're almost 70, who said that when he was a teenager, he was actually not, he was 11 years old, he said. He and his family were picked up here at the border, and they were sent from the Brownsville area down to uh, Veracruz, which is, I guess, more than 800 or 1,000 miles away from uh, from the border, uh, even though they were from Atamoros, which borders Brownsville. The whole family was shipped down there in a boat. This was in the 50s. And then they had to, they made their way back up to Matamoros. And of course they crossed in the following day since their life was in the US. He, he never knew he was from Mexico. He had always thought he was an American citizen at that time. So this particular detention camp, which I have been working with for the last 40 years, called Port Isabel Processing Center in Los Fresnos, has been in existence at least uh, through that time, as far as I know. I know beforehand I was told that it was used like an FBI or CIA training camp as well. Uh, I really have not confirmed that, but I understand it's been around for quite a few years. It's one of the larger detention centers in the country, and um, it, it holds, I understand, at least maybe 1,800 to 2,000 immigrants in that particular detention center. There's a second detention center, ICE detention center, about 30 miles away, and it's a smaller detention center, but same type of conditions anyway. People that are detained there, as you know, are people who are uh, suspect of not being U.S. citizens or not being U.S. citizens and have no status in the country or had status and or violated some form of status as for the government. Um, needless to say, they're, they're people, they're human beings, and they should be treated as such. And now with this pandemic, um, 
virus situation that we're in, it's certainly very, very dangerous for anyone detained. The detainees here at Port Isabel, uh, my understanding, were just finally told that they could ask for a mask if they wanted one. But that doesn't change the fact that they still live in very small quarters. Uh, there is no distance, social distancing for them. And um, we were just, we just learned today, or actually it came out in the public today that one of the workers there was found um, with, with the COVID uh, virus. And um, this just came to light eight days um, earlier. We had heard about it eight days ago and it just came out public today. So people have been coming in and out of this facility all this time, not knowing that that virus existed there. The workers themselves, the security guards, some of them are wearing masks now and this just started this week. The public such as myself who can still go into the facility as we're coming into the facility, there's a checkpoint with guards there and they take our temperature. They give us this one sheet of paper asking us four different questions. One is whether we have been in contact with somebody or whether we have it ourselves. Um, it also asks us whether we've ever traveled into certain countries such as China, uh, Asian countries, other European countries, Australia and such within the last 14 days and if we, have either arrived from there recently or we have been there in the past and then also um, whether or not uh, we have the flu, the cold, any kind of roughness in our voice and such and if we answer yes to any of these four then we're not going to be allowed in but that's us and the public that can take care of ourselves somewhat. What about our detainees? Our detainees don't have the facility and don't have the choices that we have. So it's a death trap for them. It really, really is. A lot of people that have been picked up here lately, well, and I would say within the last month or so, uh, that have crossed over illegally into the US and arrested by border patrol are being taken to Mexico, uh, to the border. And from one of my clients last week, she told me that she was crossed over by, by immigration at about three o'clock in the morning and then by about five or six o'clock in the morning, they had loaded up two bus loads that were traveled, that were sent to Chiapas. And they were dumped in Chiapas without any possibility of assistance, no shelter for them, nowhere to go. They were just dumped that out there in the street. They were told that the reason they were being taken down there is because of the virus and they didn't want them in the US. My client was lucky in that she was actually given documentation to see an immigration judge, but not so lucky in the sense that she's got to do it while she resides in Mexico. And I'm sure you guys have all heard about those tent cities along the border where there's like 3,000 refugees, they're waiting to be processed. And part of the problem also is that um, cases that were coming up in March and May have now been res uh, rescheduled. I've got some that have been rescheduled to August. The conditions are deplorable there at the bridge and the tent city because they're living with these little plastic tents on the floor and the cement floor. Whether it's hot or cold or whatever the conditions or the elements are, they're there uh, subject to anything. And then worst of all is they're subject to the cartels. The cartels have raped lots of women, have attacked lots of people. And we have a process called non-refoulement interview, which you can bring the detainee to a Customs and Border Patrol at the bridge, and you ask for this interview, and an asylum officer will um, ask you questions to see if you qualify to be allowed in because you have fear of, um, you have fear of remaining in Mexico, or you have been attacked one way or the other. Um, and what happens is most of these non-refoulement interviews, no matter how egregious uh, the assaults are on the detainees, or rather, well, I call them detainees because they're outside the country and they really have no country at this point. But um, the assault on these refugees is, is her horrific. Um, I have one lady who was raped in front of her um, three-year-old child. Um, she was beaten. It was horrible. She was taken to the Mexican police afterwards by somebody who found her. The Mexican police did not believe her. She finally was able to make it to a hospital. She was there about two or three days and then finally released, but she's still 
waiting. We've gone through two interviews and both interviews uh, we've lost. Um, and so it just keeps getting worse and worse with the Trump administration, as you know, uh, as to how these refugees are treated. Uh, they have little or no rights. There is no constitution for them. The asylum protection laws are really out the window for them in most of these cases. And uh, it's a horrific situation for all of them. And of course, worse now with the, with the virus. There's little or no protection for them uh, alongside the border and obviously little or no protection while they're in detention. Um, there's a border patrol stations all along the border. They've got the people, when they cross over, they may keep them maybe about a few okay. days. And they, it's like, like a, a express deportation. They'll just process them, take their fingerprints, take their names, a little bit of information, and they cross them back into Mexico within 24 to 48 hours. No longer do you have the right to ask for really asylum and ask for interviews uh, as protected as you should be protected by the law. All the while is the, the Constitution is just being violated left and right by, by the Trump administration. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Salma. Uh, just a uh, brief apology, everyone. We had some real technical difficulties, um, but we do have Gloria back now. Um, so Gloria, if you want to go ahead and, and um, talk to us about uh, the uh, campaign to free them all. Uh, free all U.S. prisoners and detainees. Um, can you hear me, Mikasi? Yeah, I can hear you. And um, if you could just hit the um, the camera button. Yep, I can see you and I, I can hear you, so you're good. Oh, you can. Okay. Um, okay, sorry about that. We're having thunderstorms here. Um, I, I want to begin by saying or talking about why do we say free them all? Because people say, well, you know, that's crazy. We can't just open the doors. Well, who's in prisons? And when, where did these prisons come from? And Monica talked about this a little bit. But I mean, prisons came out of, of the end after the Civil War, uh, after the end of slavery. And here in Houston, in a suburb, Sugarland. We just discovered uh, 95 graves of people who were in this convict lease program. The plantation owners in the South needed labor, so people were arrested and literally worked to death. Uh, they were actually not treated as well as slaves, if you can imagine, because during slavery, the property owners wanted the slaves to work their land. But under the convict lease program, if somebody died, they'd just get another prisoner. So um, we say free them all because every single person that is in prison, we say are, they're a political prisoner because they're a victim of this political system, this illegal system that we live under. Um, who should be in prison? Well, I think the head of Tyson Foods who told an older black woman to come back to work even though she was sick, well, she's dead now, including two of her coworkers. Tyson Food executives should be in prison. The head of St. Luke's Hospital in Houston should be in prison. My daughter is working in the ICU as a nurse. She had to wear the same masks for two days in the ICU. I'd like all of the executives, I can go on Amazon and buy masks. Why in the hell can I, uh, the prison, St. Luke's, not get masks? I think the executives of McDonald's or Kroger grocery stores should be in prison. They're not supplying protective equipment for their workers. The military generals and the people that work in the Pentagon, they should be in prison. They're mass murderers. Talk about serial killers. And if they don't kill our youth when they send them to fight their wars, the young people come back so mentally impaired that they can, they're damaged, some of them for the rest of their lives. So, 
serial killers, the Pentagons, the police in every major city who murder, I forget, a black person every so many minutes in this country. They're serial killers. Politicians who are refusing to shut down prisons are going to be serial killers. And if Iran can uh, release 45,000 prisoners, so can each state here in this country. Child abusers? Well, I'll tell you what. The Customs and Border Patrol, the ICE agents, the people that separate children from their parents at the border, that's child abuse of a horrible extreme. In some detention centers, I've read about brothers and sisters or siblings being separated who were crying for each other. That's child abuse. So yeah, there's some people I think should be locked up, but they're not the ones that are in prison now. Right now in Texas, I think there's 15 prisons that are uh, on lockdown because people have the COVID-19 virus uh, and also officers have it. We are asking for really these prisons to be death camps if they don't let people out. I want to read to you, excuse me, from a letter I got from a, a prisoner who's a friend of mine and a friend of Workers World, uh, Nanan Williams. Uh, he says, so much is going on. Whoops, did I do something? So much is going on in the prisons that is so stupid. When they allow us to go outside, we're monitored by one guard. So when we're going out and coming in, that same guard is shaking us down, meaning they're doing strip searches, wearing the same gloves. And who, you know, God only knows what they're passing on to everybody. When we go to Chow, they, they claim they're taking 10 prisoners at a time, but they're actually taking entire cell blocks. We sit at a table for four people. The dishwasher is broken. So that means the trays are unclean. They only have a couple of hundred trays. So prisoners per meal will have eaten off the same tray that three or four other prisoners have just eaten off of. There's a single pitcher on our tables with water or juice that we all share. That pitcher sits there for all the different shifts of prisoners that come in to eat. Um, and the guards that are patting us down when we're going to the chow hall are using the same gloves on all of us. And some of them aren't even wearing gloves at all. The showers that hold 80 people, they're putting over 100 of us in there at a time. Who knows what that water is spraying on all of us. And to answer your question, no, we don't have bleach. They won't give us bleach, period. We can't even clean our own living areas. And lastly, the stress and fear is causing so many problems, <clears throat> particularly for the prisoners that are mentally ill who are locked down and hearing about a virus, don't understand what's going on. They're getting into fights and it's really, really bad. Um, I think we need something revolutionary to happen rather than just keeping us locked up all across the country. They need to let us out, put us on monitors if they want, but otherwise this virus is going to start spreading all over the prison system. Um, so I just, I just want to end by saying that, yes, we say free them all because the real criminals of this society are not in prison. We say that prisons are concentration camps for the poor and the oppressed because that's exactly what they are. Right now in the Harris, Houston, Harris County Jail, there's 9,000 prisoners. It, these jails have become the largest mental health facilities because of the number of mentally ill people in there. But the vast majority haven't been convicted of a crime. They're awaiting trial and they're being punished because they're too poor to get out on bail. 
this is criminal. And the people responsible for that are criminals. So I think we need to open up the jails, open up the prisons, open up the detention centers, and lock up the real criminals. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce our next guest, uh, Quest Moore. Uh, Quest organizes with the New Orleans Workers Group and Take Em Down NOLA, a group which has been working to take down symbols of white supremacy and slavery. Uh, Quest, can you connect the history of slavery and, and mass incarceration and the work that you're doing now against migrant detention in Louisiana? And um, also, you know, if you could tell us about some of the actions that you've been organizing now during the pandemic, um, that would be great. Absolutely. So um, thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak and to share on behalf of my, uh, my coalitions, my comrades, and everybody in New Orleans is doing this work. Um, so first and foremost, Take Em Down NOLA was established about five years ago this summer. Uh, and our mission is basically the removal of all symbols of white supremacy in the city of New Orleans uh, as they reflect the systems of racial and economic injustice and oppression of a more than 60% black city. And so um, in the city of New Orleans, we've had at least 17 my Mr. White Supremacy, uh, now 13. Thanks to some of our organizing, we were able to successfully get four of them removed back in 2017. Um, but all of that was really just a wake up call and a rally to the people in the wake of the Black Lives Matter movement to um, highlight the fact that, uh, you know, state sanctioned violence has an entire system behind it, an entire apparatus behind it. Like uh, Gloria was saying just now, you know, a black person is killed in this country every day, extrajudicially. Um, uh, or, or at least, and you know, quite often there's no there's no justice for it. And so we wanted to indict the system as a whole when we first came out with the work with taking down NOLA and show that you know this happens for a reason. This happens because the violence of the state has been codified inside of this country since its inception, since the very beginning. Um, it's been okay to do with a black body, which you will. Not to mention what's done to brown bodies and was done to the indigenous people of Louisiana before New Orleans was ever established, before it was um, colonized by the French. This was called Bubancha land. And this was the land that was, uh, you know, in, in native indigenous speak that basically meant gathering of tongues, a gathering of several cultures. So this has always been a port city. The actual infrastructure and the layout of it was established by the native indigenous people who had been here about 3,000 years, some 30 or so groups. And they had been here um, gathering and establishing culture and technology and creating the, the template, the blueprint that the French and the Spanish, I should say first, uh, stole from them and created off of their backs. And so when you look at a city that to this day uh, still has, um, you know, a majority black population that lives in 53% poverty, it's essentially um, gone from the plantation to the prison. And it's, it's, it's a prison house economically, and that leads to a prison, a literal prison house. And as far as the native indigenous people who have been here, um, you know, they've been marginalized and pushed to outskirt uh, towns or what have you. And so right here in the city where it's mostly black folks and it's 400,000 or so population, 53% um, of us live in poverty. And that's a result of uh, wage slavery. It's a result of the fact we have um, one of the, the most booming tourism industry in the world. $8 billion a year comes through this city, through this very small city. And yet hardly any of that money obviously trickles down to the hospitality workers and the people who are actually holding that system up on their backs. A lot of hospitality workers are working without benefits. They're working um, in obviously very low paying jobs. And so it puts us in jeopardy and at risk. And, you know, um, that risk leads to you know, higher crime rates because people do, as we say in New Orleans, get it how they live and try to figure out how to make money outside of um, you know, the so-called legal means. And that leads to uh, the so-called uh, crime. And the crime leads to us being the number one carceral state in the world's history. And of course, you know, America is the number one carceral state in the world. Louisiana is number one in the country. Uh, we might be number two to Oklahoma at this point, but usually it's been us. And number one in the state is New Orleans. And so right here in this very small town is where you have the, the greatest prison state in the United States. And you see uh, the reflection of that, um, you know, in prisons like Angola, which was once formerly the plantation Angola. And so what that's led to is uh, these are death concentration camps, basically, um, in an instance like 
what we're in right now with a pandemic between the prisons themselves and between, you know, a population where one out of five of us are in the hospitality industry, um, the so-called essential jobs, a lot of them have been sent home and don't have work or the ones who still have to go to work are the most exposed and then the least uh, protected because of course they don't have the uh, kind of health care that they need in the first place living in uh, poverty conditions and wages. So in response to that, what we did about two days ago, the New Orleans Worker Group, Workers Group, which is one of at least a few coalitions that grew out of taking down NOLA a couple of years ago, we organized a motorcade and got about 70 cars to uh, drive down to uh, City Hall, to uh, also Tulane and Gravier, where um, a lot of uh, incarcerated uh, folks are locked up. And we also drove by the ICE detention camps. Louisiana has, has because it's you know a prison capital, has two of the biggest ICE detention camps in the country. They were just transitioned from prisons over to ICE detention camps. So we wanted to call alert to the fact that um, none of these people belong in prison in the first place. Um, the real criminals are the system. They put them in a position to be inside of a, a cage in the first place. And it's even more of a crime now that they're sitting there in that place where all of the virus and all of the disease is concentrated. At least 15 cases were already detected inside of the Orleans Parish uh, prison. And we know that that's only going to spread to the workers who are going to bring it back to the people. So um, as one of our coalitions um, says, the New Orleans Hospitality Workers Association, if we get sick, you get sick. And that applies not just for the cooks and for all of the essential workers, but it's also for our brothers and sisters and our siblings locked up. So we took that stand of solidarity uh, for them, with them. The bourgeois media and press, of course, has tried to erase um, all of that narrative. They don't want people to believe that, you know, uh, these are people that believe that, that deserve their freedom. And they've uh, tried to wipe over the story, but we're keeping, we're keeping that uh, story going. So that's the, that's the most present work that we've done here in Wallace. Thank you, Chris. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, Sophia Williams is based out of New York City and works with a campaign to bring home Mumia, bring Mumia home. Sorry. Uh, in a country that incarcerates millions, Sophia, tell us about why the case of Mumia Abu Jamal is significant. And if you could also enlighten us on some of the struggles that you've led to fight for better health care inside and ultimately for Mumia and all prisoners' freedom. That'd be great. Great. Well, I would like to first say thank you to Workers World for offering me the opportunity to join in on what is thus far a really uh, phenomenal uh, call. Uh, so who's Mumia and why is this case important? Uh, so Mumia Abu Jamal is a father, he's a husband, an activist, a journalist, a writer, author, former Black Panther, and currently a prisoner imprisoned in the Pennsylvania uh, prisons for 38 years. Um, he's the most famous political prisoner the world over. His case is important because he was, you know, wrongfully framed and charged for a murder for a crime he did not commit. Just the same as the many other unknown faces that are con convicted wrongfully and sentenced to prison, you know, every single year. Uh, so Mumia's case is also important uh, because his political beliefs and the writings and his writings threatened the status quo and you know with that his case represents the horrific lens the the uh the state will go to silence the truth behind their dark and evil agendas so uh to, to end on that another key piece why his case is important is that the struggle to free him sheds so much light on the on the many other political prisoners languishing inside of America's gulags and to, you know, tie that into what was just um, asked uh, in, in the other question, we have a perfect example with the struggle for, you know, basic health care for Mumia. So I don't know if everyone knows but or remembers that, you know, this battle for health care for Mumia has been a very, very long and uphill um, time, which is actually still continuing. We struggled back in 2015 to get him proper and adequate health attention when he was on death doorsteps, literally facing a really bad skin itch, severe weight loss, and, 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 and just extreme tiredness and weakness, all of which basically sent him into uh, a, di a diabetic coma. So a year later, Mumia still had not received treatment after a court uh, battle for a few weeks, and in early 2016, 
in, in early 2016, you know, that was a really interesting time because he was actually denied the treatment on a technicality. And so we didn't give up the fight. And by the next year, early 2017, he was granted the Hep C treatment. So unfortunately, the thing is, by that time, Mumia had received sclerosis of the liver. And most importantly, till this day, Mumia is not 100% well. And, you know, with the current appalling prison conditions now with COVID-19 running rampant, it makes it that much more important in the call to free Mumia. And, you know, just, just, just on the part of the prison conditions, we all know the prisons are a slow death sentence. And right now, every prisoner is basically facing a prescribed death sentence with the rampant pandemic and the slow moving release of, 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 of so many um, of them. So, you know, that will just lead to an even more serious health crisis. And, and, and it goes back to why we're saying free them all. And I just wanted to repeat something that I believe it was Gloria that said, you know, why we say free them all, because we do believe in a higher society where prisoners' lives do matter as well. And so, what was said is that those in prisons are their political prisoners, considering that prisons are just another form of slavery. So we say free them all because America's hall of justice likes to treat those on the inside as second class citizens or sees them as an other. And, you know, that is unlike what the so called um, Pledge, of, Pledge of Allegiance states, where it says liberty and justice for all. So lastly, we say that we, we believe you know, in the abolition of the prison uh, enslaved industrial complex. So that's, um, that's, that's, that's what I have. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Um, so next up, we're going to be uh, speaking with Kevin Karen uh, from Georgia Detention Watch uh, to report on the Stewart Detention Center and the campaign to shut down uh, the Atlanta City Detention Center. Um, Kevin? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks to the Workers World Party. Thanks to everybody else who's here. It's certainly an honor to be amongst such incredible leaders in this struggle. Uh, Georgia Detention Watch is a coalition of organizations and individuals dedicated to fighting alongside immigrants to end migrant detention, deportation, and mass incarceration on the whole. We understand immigrant detention in the context of mass incarceration and has been previously stated so eloquently by my fellow panelists. Uh, this is the result of the legacy of enslavement, convict leasing, colonization, white supremacy, and capitalism. These forces have combined actually in, in the US South to make the South a space that is uh, disproportionately affected uh, by the carceral system here in Georgia. Uh, it, we're no exception. In fact, um, we have in the country with the uh, highest incarceration rate in the world, um, we are the state with the fourth largest incarcerated population and we're the number one state for people under correctional control. We lock up about 1% of our, our, our people here in Georgia and uh, there are 6% of people in Georgia that are under some form of carceral control, whether they're in cages or on parole. This is why we've worked together with uh, folks fighting mass incarceration, organizations like Women on the Rise, Racial Justice Action Center, uh, the Solutions Not Punishment Collective, to fight with them, to fight at the Atlanta City Detention Center to close the jail on the city side, but also fight the contract that the jail had with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, we defeated that contract, and today the jail has dwindled down to uh, still, still, just less than 40 people. Um, we're trying very hard right now to get those people out. Um, and nowhere else is the, the connection between mass incarceration of uh, black and brown folks in our history and the connection to immigration as apparent as down at the Stewart Detention Center, three hours south of Atlanta. Um, Stewart was built in 2006 as a speculative project by Corrections Corporation of America, now called Core Civic. It was built uh, by this for-profit corporation that literally put this jail in one of the poorest counties in Georgia. Um, they preyed on this county and it sat empty for several years while they tried to get a contract with the uh, state to lock up more of the people in our state. They failed to do that and eventually they were able to uh, get 
get a contract with Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and Stewart became one of the largest immigrant detention centers in the U.S. It has uh, 2,000 beds, and at this point, we understand that there's somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 people in there today. Uh, the struggle to defeat Stewart and to ab abolish ICE uh, began immediately from people who were incarcerated. Uh, today, in fact, at Stewart Detention Center, people locked up um, actually called us a few hours ago, and we got from five different sources, uh, family members, a couple folks who are locked up, they called us and they shared that there was actually an uprising today. In one of the units, uh, there were actually people who um, were able to take control of the units from the guards. They got the keys to the unit, they got outside of unit three, they went to other units to the windows, knocked on the windows, encouraged resistance, and uh, protested for everybody to be freed. Um, and they were eventually uh, attacked with violence and they were put down with um, pepper spray and tear gas and many of them are on uh, in solitary confinement right now. Since 2015, we've seen four deaths at the facility, two of them by suicide after weeks in solitary confinement. Uh, we know that this facility is not prepared to deal with the uh, crisis of COVID-19 spreading in jails and detention centers, um, and that has certainly heightened the crisis. So we understand our struggle uh, to be connected to mass incarceration. We also in understand it to be an international scope. There's literally a judge that uh, deports more people than any other judge in our state who is also sitting on the board of the School of the Americas Watch, where uh, at the military uh, school they actually trained foreign militia to perpetrate coups, uh, to put down uprisings in their own countries, and literally torture their own people. Uh, Judge Dan Tremble is uh, this individual, and um, understanding those connections has been really important, and that's why we're fighting to get everybody out now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. That's great. Um, next, we're going to have Susie Albohawa speak. Susie is the author of Mornings in Janine and more recently um, Against the Loveless World. She is a Workers' World Party comrade and Palestinian activist. Susan, tell us about the situation facing Palestinians who were incarcerated by their occupier, Israel. Um, and if you could tell us about the conditions in these prisons and how it relates to U.S. prisons. Thanks, Leilani. Um, so I just want to start by um, uh, acknowledging that today's the anniversary of the Diyar Yassin massacre that took place on um, April 9th, 1948, um, when Zionist gangs, the Irgun, Haganah, and Stern gangs went house to house in a small Palestinian village, lined people against the wall and sprayed them with bullets, um, gutted pregnant women, and smashed the skulls of children. Um, the Irgun and the Haganah gangs were the precursors to Israel's current state military. So I just want to um, acknowledge that moment in Palestinian history. Um, today there are roughly 5,500 Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli jails. Approximately 200 are children um, and about 500 um, are held in something called administrative detention, which means that they're arrested as a preventive measure and they're held indefinitely without ever being charged with a crime. Uh, many people spend years languishing in this um, administrative detention because Israel can renew the orders indefinitely without ever bringing any evidence or charges against uh, the detainees. The situation for Palestinian political prisoners is quite dire in normal circumstances, um, but human rights groups uh, fear the worst is happening now. Um, so, so-called emergency regulation measures that were enacted on March the 15th have banned Palestinians from meeting their lawyers or receiving pa um, family visitations. Prisoners who are usually denied the right to use phones in prison um, can only now consult with their attorneys over the phone in the event of an upcoming hearing. However, court hearings have been canceled. So in effect, Palestinian political prisoners are completely cut off from the outside world. Um, they're basically under a total blackout at the moment. Um, they're being uh, also being denied basic needs to curb the spread of the virus. Um, all they have 
are bars of soap um, and they're being refused even basic food needs. Uh, prisoners typically have to buy uh, necessities, but now the amount of vegetables, for example, that they can buy have been cut, um, as well as meat and fish. They've also been banned from buying cleaning products to sanitize their bathrooms and their cells. And um, uh, so prisoners have been trying to organize and, and um, they put forth some demands for protective kits, um, including masks and gloves and disinfectant. Um, and in response, the Israel's prison service told them to use their socks to make masks and um, soap to disinfect their, uh, their surroundings. And after they made that response, um, the prison authorities then um, uh, uh, banned soap and socks um, in a clear move to provoke the prisoners while the world is distracted by the coronavirus. Um, political prisoners are typically held in very crowded, unsanitary conditions with um, high levels of contact. Uh, among each other. So there's really no uh, real way to, for them to protect themselves um, from infection. Uh, on April the 1st, Israel released a Palestinian from prison and um, the Palestinian Authority quarantined him right away. And uh, the next day he tested positive for COVID-19. So it's clear that prisoners are indeed infected. Um, but uh, Israel is just not uh, releasing any information. On the other hand, Israel has released its own criminals from prisons in order to reduce infection among Jewish prisoners. And human rights groups are calling on Israel to do the same for Palestinian political prisoners, um, particularly for vulnerable Palestinians who are older or have underlying medical conditions. Um, and many of these are, are actually administrative detention detainees who, uh, who haven't even been charged with anything. Um, uh, an example are the uh, nearly 200 Palestinian children who are in Israel's prisons. Some are as young as 12 years old and none of whom have been able to speak with their parents, with advocates or lawyers. Um, they have no grown ups to speak to. Uh, and under normal circumstances, their conditions are quite dire, um, but the level of their bewilderment now is surely intensified um, that they're not allowed any contact with the outside world. So the scale of the problem really remains unknown as Israel has not um, tested any of the 5,500 Palestinians in jail, even those who were known to be in contact with um, infected guards. Um, there were uh, several of those cases that are known. They and Israel merely um, put them in isolation but never tested them. Um, additionally, Israel continues to raid Palestinian homes and, uh, and conduct these arbitrary arrests that are quite routine of Palestinians um, just kind of busting down their doors and, and raiding their homes with dogs. And, um, but now they're, they're arriving in full, in full uh, PPE gear. So they're protecting themselves, but they're exposing Palestinians and they're arresting them and hauling them off. Um, and Israel also recently demolished a, a pop-up hospital tent that um, the Palestinian Authority had set up to treat cases of the virus. Um, so Palestinian prisoner rights groups have been appealing to various international bodies for help, um, so far really to no avail. Uh, mostly they have um, try, been trying to plead with the International Committee of the Red Cross, but there seems to be um, very little movement by anyone to, um, to protect them. And um, they're, you know, they're, they're exacerbating the problem by weaponizing the virus in other ways. Um, a case in point is uh, a man named Mahmoud Atta, who was arrested in his home uh, on March 22nd in one of these um, military night raids. And he was sent to Majiddo prison um, on suspicion that he had been in contact with someone who tested positive. Um, so that's what he was arrested for. And they, they threw him in detention and um, extended his detention twice. And, um, and they um, twice also postponed um, a hearing for his appeal. 
he was put in deplorable conditions in an isolation cell that did not have a bathroom. Um, he was not given any clean clothes uh, and a whole campaign had to be mounted before uh, they would move him to a facility that had a bathroom. Um, and he's, he's, still, he's still being held. Um, so at the moment, um, there's a hunger strike among Palestinian prisoners. Um, they are demanding to be tested uh, and given adequate protective gear. They're also, they've also been refusing to allow new detainees into their wings after prison authorities tried to bring some in. Um, they're quite, quite uh, frightened, it seems. Um, they're also demanding that authorities conduct head counts through camera systems and that guards also wear masks and gloves because ultimately they're the ones who are the source of the infection that's being brought into populations that are already isolated. Um, Adana, which is a, a prisoner rights group, petitioned the courts to allow at least private phone calls. Um, the, in the, that petition cited an example um, where a phone call between Adana's attorney um, Adada's attorney and, and a Palestinian detained in Ofer prison um, uh, in which a, their conversation was actually broadcast on loudspeakers in front of prison guards and other inmates. Um, and on, on the other hand, Israeli criminals in, uh, in, in, you know, in, in those prisons are still allowed to use uh, prison phones. So this isn't really about, uh, it's not about the virus. And I, um, uh, I want to read um, a post from the daughter of uh, Khalida Jarrar <coughs> she, that she posted on Facebook the other day. Um, Khalida Jarrar is a high profile Palestinian political prisoner. Um, she's an elected leader and member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, um, which is a Palestinian uh, Marxist Lenin Leninist organization that was founded by George Habash in 1967. Um, Renda is uh, currently in administrative detention where she has been languishing without charge or trial. Um, so this is what her daughter Soha wrote. We were raised with my dad getting locked up every few months. That means that we were raised with the military busting into our home every few months, destroying our belongings and taking our father away. I first met my father when I was four years old and it took me a while to figure out this man, um, who figure out the, who this man was suddenly living with us. I used to hold on to his picture, but when I met him, he looked nothing like the picture and I couldn't understand that it was the same person. The years passed and we got used to our dad going to prison every few months. We thought it was just a normal thing. It was our normal. Um, I understood at a very young age that every Palestinian had to go to prison and had to get tortured. And when I was 10 years old, I began to worry that I wouldn't be able to withstand torture when my turn came. Today, I'm much older than 10 years, but when Israel took my mother away for the first time, I was once again that terrified little girl. I didn't want them to take her to the point that I, was a, um, that I thought about throwing her from the balcony when they came into our home to arrest her in 2015. It has been five years and we don't know if she's with us or not, when they will come back for her, when she, um, even when she's home, um, if she's alive, when she's in prison. My mother's in prison now and we don't know how to reach her during this pandemic and we know nothing about her condition. We don't know if she has the virus, if she's able to breathe. She's already sick and has a weakened immune system. This coronavirus has immense political dimensions. Thanks. I'm done. <laughs> okay, so. Thank you, Susie. Thank you. Um, okay, well, if you're interested in getting involved in struggles like these, we encourage you to join Workers World Party. You can go to workersworldparty.org slash join to learn more. Um, and then Mikasi is going to introduce the next speaker. Yeah, our next uh, guest is Amber Rose Howard. Uh, 
they're the executive director of Curb, Californians against, uh, United for Responsible Budget. Experiencing a felony conviction as a young adult propelled Amber Rose into a lifetime commitment of organizing against the prison industrial complex and building up the power of black people and all others impacted by state violence. Um, so uh, Amber Rose, can you tell us about the uh, struggle against incarceration in California? Hi, yes. Um, thank you for having me on. Um, really appreciate your listening ears. Um, I work with a coalition of over uh, 80 organizations that was, that was founded in 2003, whose mission is to um, uh, reduce the number of people in prisons and jails, reduce the number of prisons and jails in the state, and then capture budget savings um, and shift those those resources into community-based alternatives to incarceration and community resources that actually build safe and healthy communities. Um, we envision a world without prisons, and so this is our way of moving toward that goal. Um, we don't believe that anybody be belongs in a cage, and I think we have to hold true to that sort of abolitionist framework because when we start to say that some people belong in the cage, then that makes room for many people to be put in cages. And that's why we have an incarceration crisis on our hands right now. California spends over $16 billion uh, on the corrections budget and it grows every single year. Uh, we have about 35 prisons in the state, including lots of other um, prison-like institutions, including for youth um, and including contracts with private uh, companies. Um, and so I think, you know, right now what we're focusing on um, you know, as we're always calling for the end of incarceration, as we're always calling for alternatives to incarceration, um, CURB is really focused on making sure that people understand in this moment where we are concerned about uh, people who are incarcerated um, coming in contact with the coronavirus, it's really important to realize that there is no way for folks to protect themselves inside. Um, you know, it is important to understand that we need to look at this from a public health lens. Um, you know, so as we see lots of organizations, lots of groups uh, all across the state, all across the country even, calling for the release of people, many people are focused on only releasing people that have a short time left to serve, only releasing people who have low level offenses, which are non-serious, non-violent, non-sexual. We're calling for, um, for those distinctions to not be a part of the equation. We want to make sure that um, we're putting forward demands that would allow folks who are elderly and medically vulnerable to be released, regardless of their conviction type. Again, this is a public health issue. And we, when we do that, right, when we're only calling for the release of people who are um, in the category of those low level offenses, I think what we're doing is forgetting to recognize that people have spent decades inside transforming themselves. Just as those of us on, on, who are not incarcerated, you know, spend time transforming ourselves, people on the inside do that as well. Um, our governor has outwardly proclaimed that he would not, he is not interested in releasing anyone um, who has a violent conviction. He actually calls them violent people. What he fails to realize is that a violent conviction does not make you a violent person. I have a violent conviction from when I was 18 years old. Uh, and, and you know, that does not make me a violent person. And I agree that that is true for so many folks um, who are also convicted of violent things, especially the ones who are still inside. We also wanna make sure that we're calling out vast clemencies and releases at this time. You know, our governor has said, we ha has made um, a plan to release about 3,500 people from California state prisons. Um, and those releases will come from accelerated parole dates. So that, that's folks who uh, were gonna be paroled in the next 30 to 90 days already. That does not include um, the 30,000 people that we have over the age of 50. That does not include over 30,000 people that we have serving on three strikes. That does not include the over 5,000 people that have been serving on life without parole who already have spent decades in prison and who are the most vulnerable people in the midst of this crisis. So we're calling for our governor to include those folks, to stop uh, setting forward and perpetuating that false dichotomy of 
who's deserving and who's undeserving to be protected. Our governor put forward a moratorium on the death penalty last year, and we, we don't see a difference in when you're leaving folks inside right now who deserve to be released, uh, that's no different from sentencing them to death. People will die. Um, there's over 60 staff members at the California Department of Corrections who tested positive. There's over 30 people who are imprisoned who have tested positive, including um, uh, people in the women's prison. Uh, Chino Institute for Women is right now um, on lockdown, and we know that they don't have resources to protect themselves. They don't even have resources to um, you know, keep their living spaces clean, as we've already heard. That's the case for many folks who are in prison. You know, so I think that we have to really focus on making sure that we're including people um, with all conviction types when we're thinking about releasing elders and releasing people who are medically vulnerable. Um, and we need clemencies now. We have a campaign that we have partnered with Release, Release Aging People in Prison and the Parole Preparation Project in New York, along with California Coalition for Women Prisoners here in California, where we're calling for clemency coast to coast. Governors Newsom and Cuomo out in New York uh, you know, set themselves forward as very, very progressive governors. And they have not proven that. You know, the lives are in their hands and they have the opportunity to save lives. And so we are making sure that we're calling and speaking up for folks who are being overlooked in this moment um, and trying to protect our elders. You know, and so we uh, do have a, a, a we've, we've been doing call-ins, emails to our governors, and we have Twitter uh, campaign that we're running to sort of lift up that work. Um, we're doing another Twitter storm tomorrow, so we'll be sending out materials to folks tonight to be able to join us in that, calling for clemency coast to coast. You know, the only answer is vast releases. People will not, um, people will not benefit from any other kind of a response um, who are incarcerated except for release. Uh, and so, and, 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 you know, I think another question that folks ask when we talk about releasing folks is where will people go? Well, you know, people have families. People's families are ready and able and willing to accept them back home. And so if we don't have vast releases uh, now, we will see people die. Um, and so that's the work that CURB is, you know, focused on right now in response to, um, you know, this, this crisis. And I'll share out uh, our demand letter in the chat so that folks have access to that. Um, it's on CCWP's website, the Drop LWAP, um, and it talks all about our Drop LWAP campaign where we're calling for the end of life without parole sentencing in the state of California, and we're calling for the commutation of every person who is right now serving time with life without parole. Um, I know that's probably my time, so I'll cap it there, but I'm going to stick around for questions. That's fantastic. Yeah, um, we actually have a lot of people uh, putting questions. There's a Q&A button right down there. Um, so you can um, add your questions and we're going to be doing Q&A after our speakers. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're going to introduce our last speaker. Um, Miranda Chrisman is a writer for Workers World Newspapers Tear Down the Walls Prisoner page. Um, and they're going to be speaking tonight about the importance of sharing the stories of people that are incarcerated. Uh, Miranda, tell us about the work of Workers World Newspaper in the prisons. I've heard that it gets out to nearly um, a thousand prisoners across the country. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, we do have a subscription program to provide all of those subscriptions to prisoners for free um, through our Patreon. We are able to send our paper, which is the print um, version is suspended right now during the crisis, but we we send the paper that talks about uh, people's movements across the globe, as well as what's happening in prisons. Um, and particularly our prison page uh, draws on a legacy of prison newsletters and the medium of written communication of the past. Um, our Workers' World's Prisoner Solidarity Committee in the past um, has worked on previous versions of this page. And they, uh, in, in the 60s and 70s, around the time of the Attica uprising, as well as Auburn and Lewisburg uprisings in uh, the early 70s. Um, we have aims to increase like radical communication across barriers that are put up to keep us in or out. Um, we are focused on providing a space for incarcerated folks to communicate with one another and for them to put things out in public. Um, we 
want to use this written space as a place to encourage analysis of different forms of incarceration. Um, we want to communicate ideas on how to improve conditions to reduce the number of people in jail and prison. To shorten sentences while believing that society needs to be radically changed so that prisons cease to exist. Um, and we uh, We, we do so because prison abolition is necessary and it's, it's a long-standing battle. We, we know that these systems um, are monuments to white supremacy and colonialism. And we see that particularly even in how the U.S. exports mass incarceration to other countries. The U.S. government is involved in the prison systems of at least 38 different countries and their programs involve construction of new prisons if if they build them, they will fill them. Prison guard training, accreditation, um, data management, and overall design. There is a Supermax prison in Florida whose exact layout has been replicated in Colombia. Um, and, and common features of these, uh, of the prisons uh, that are structured on the US model include overcrowding, neglect of healthcare, use of torture and extreme uh, and punitive isolation, transfer of prisoners far away from families and communities, uh, severe restrictions on visits, including legal defenders and, and prison militarization. We've seen during this crisis that uh, not only in prisons, but in migrant detention, they have used pepper spray against uh, prisoners that have decided to take a stand against terrible, horrible conditions. Um, they're more focused on quelling these uprisings than they are focused on stopping the spread of these diseases. And so we, we advocate for tearing down the walls and building the social structures and conditions that will allow for that to happen. Um, we say no to prison imperialism, uh, no new Jim Crows, free them all and tear down the walls. Thank you, Miranda, so much. Um, so we're going to move on to question and answer. Um, we have folks can see there's a Q&A box and people can write questions in and we're gonna invite the panelists to respond to questions. Makasina. Yeah, and um, you know, panelists, if you want to uh, address something that the other panelists said or make um, some closing remarks, that would be uh, excellent also. Uh, one of the questions we have here is from uh, Amy Cyclunas, and uh, it is why a sweeping call for, sorry, I just lost it. Yeah, uh, just give me one second. Um, for some reason, the um, question just disappeared. Uh, I've got it, it's in, the answer. it's in the answer. Box or something. Oh, okay. So it moved. Got it. Oh, yeah. um, why is sweeping call for release uh, more effective than uh, making prison conditions better at protecting inmates from the spread of the virus? Uh, what about folks who do not have a place to go or the uh, places they can go are not adequate for protecting them from the virus? So if anyone wants to address that question or any other, uh, that would be great. I'd, I'd love to address that question. Um, I think, first of all, folks have to realize that uh, in a place like California, and I'm sure it's true, is the same thing is true for many other states. We are at, we are at a federal mandated cap in our prison population at 137.5%. There is, it is impossible to give people enough space to social distance and it is, we have seen that it's impossible for people to get the resources that they need in order to keep themselves clean and to keep their living spaces clean. The only answer is release. And I think when, again, when we think about where people will go, we cannot underestimate the number of people who already have family members supporting them while they're incarcerated, who are willing and ready and able to accept them back home 
and into their communities once they, re once they are released. And when we think about the fact that California spends over $16 billion on their prison budget, we can shift that money so that it goes to community-based organizations who have already been working in reentry for decades so that they can expand their capacity to take care of folks. There are empty houses, there are vacant places that can be taken over by reentry groups who are very well equipped to take care of folks when they come home um, that, can, that can be used to expand their capacity. So, you know, the answer of where will people go? Well, they'll come here. They were living in the community before they were incarcerated. And so there are places in the community where they can return to. We cannot underestimate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We also just want to announce that um, there's, we got, we got word that in Texas on April 19th, there's going to be a statewide car caravan um, to the prisons and detention centers. And there's also an organizing effort to build for May Day. So any of you who are in the Texas area, please reach out and um, get involved in this effort. So. Okay, so would any of our uh, would any of our other panelists like to make any closing remarks? Uh, I would. Okay, Monica, go okay. ahead. Well, just briefly, um, just looking at some of the uh, responses you know, in the chat. I think that the main thing that all of us are saying, that all of us have been saying so eloquently in this um, amazing webinar is that the prisons do not exist under capitalism to rehabil rehabilitate people. That is not why they exist. And as I stated and others have stated regarding how the prison or the penal system began in the first place, you know, hundreds of years ago uh, in this country. Uh, it was all, it's all about social order. It's all about keeping the majority of, of the people subjugated and down and repressed in hopes that they will not rebel against an oppressive system. That system could have been feudalism. And right now we're talking about the system of capitalism and imperialism from Palestine to right here, to Colombia, uh, all over the world where capitalism exists. That's why the prison system um, was built because it's part of the state, it's part of the repressive state, just like the police, just like the, the, um, the Pentagon, um, ICE, all of them exist to keep uh, the people down, workers and oppressed people. But, you know, if, if the ruling class wasn't afraid of, of people in the first place, they wouldn't have needed all this repression. And it exists because the ruling class and the bosses, they are afraid of the masses of people. And that's why they use the police to break up strikes and keep people in prison. So um, I thought Amber was so eloquent in what she was saying in terms of, you know, the resources are there. <laughs> the resources are there in terms of, you know, bringing the, bringing the prison, prisoners home. If they need real rehabilitation because of how society has treated them, we can make sure they have rehabilitation centers, uh, uh, mental health centers, the hospitals. We opened the hospitals. We opened them so people can get the care that they need and not the demonization that they've been suffering from. So anyway, that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Um, we also just wanted to announce that, you know, over the course of the night, we've had uh, over 200 people participate in this call. So the message of all of our panelists is getting out, you know, across the country and perhaps across the world. And we're really um, excited about that. Um, are there any other comments from panelists? Comments, questions? Um, we did want to, oh, sorry. Leilani? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Gloria. Could, can you turn your video on? Okay. Let's yeah, it looks like we have Leilani and then um, I think Kevin wants to go, so we can do in that order. You mean Gloria? <laughs> I'm trying to turn my oh, video Gloria, on. Oh, Gloria, sorry. Why can't I turn it on? You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh. 
Um, okay, let me see. Well, that's okay, I guess, if you want to just go ahead. And... Hmm. Oh, oh, okay, the host, never mind, let me see. Ah, there you go. Okay, I wanted to answer the question that a person put on the Q&A thing, who said that, I think it was a woman, uh, who said she thought all prisoners should be released except those on death row. And I agree with the first part, yes, all should be released, but I wanted to answer about death row. There are a little under 3,000 prisoners on death row in the United States. Um, there's been, I think, 1,600 executions, almost 600, 600 of them right here in Texas. I have been visiting death row since 1987, I believe. I've witnessed two friends being executed, and I, I still visit a number of, of uh, the men. The women's, there's only six women in Texas, and I, I write to one, but I haven't visited any of them. But anyway, you could ask a prison guard whether they would rather work in general population or death row, and they'd say death row, because most of the people on death row have been there a long time. They wait anywhere from 10 to 20 years or more before their executions come up. Uh, one man I visit has been there 40 years. He was 18. He's now, what, 60 or something. Um, they are not, just like most people in prison, they're not the same young person who committed the crime. Everybody grows up uh, and develops over the years, and that includes death row. And if you look at prisoners in general, including death row, so many of these were people that never had a, a lick of a chance to even be part of society. They were born into poverty, into racism, and were never, were always on the outside. But I think being on death row teaches men and women um, a lot. And so I think everybody on death row should be released along with everybody else. Now there are people on death row who are innocent. There are people that are mentally ill and certainly need health care. There are people with very low IQs. Um, so if the people that are on death row who really have serious mental problems Society should be able to deal with those. But I think death row prisoners are, in general, like any other uh, set of prisoners, and I think they should all be released. That's it. Thank you. Um, Kevin, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, thanks. I think that Monica's uh, point was excellent. I agree with everything that's been said. I wanted to address, there was a question about, um, has anyone engaged in the strategy of convincing um, guards and other people to quit or not go to work? That is something that we've entertained. Um, at at uh, Stewart Detention Center, there have been two staff that have already had confirmed cases. Now we're hearing that there are, uh, we just got word that there are five concern confirmed cases of detained individuals, which will very quickly spread. There's 33 suspected cases. Um, a whole unit worth of guards had to stay home, which means the facility is incredibly understaffed. And then with the uprising today, there's a lot of fear. Um, we think there are a lot of contradictions in trying to, quote unquote, work with correctional officers. That said, we have engaged in a very honest approach where we say, uh, to people, look, we believe the detention center um, and these prisons, jails need to be shut down. Uh, we believe that your people, um, in, in this is when we're actually uh, communicating with some union leaders at this time, uh, to say, we believe your people should have a job elsewhere. 
and we'd be willing to fight for them to have a job elsewhere. That said, right now we can all unite around the goal of public health. And so we believe that a temporary closure of the facility would serve the public health interests of both the people that we care about who are incarcerated, as well as your workers, because they're not prepared for uh, what's coming. So it's a strategy that we've talked about. Again, there are some contradictions, but I um, want to thank all the panelists and, and thank you all for a great webinar. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to ask Amber Rose, wanted to make an announcement about an action coming up, and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. Yes, thank you so much, Leilani. Just wanted to again remind folks that we're lifting up the call for clemency coast to coast tomorrow on Twitter. You can follow us at Curb Prisons, uh, where we will be um, asking folks to call Governor Newsom and Governor Cuomo um, to call for those releases for folks, to call for those clemencies. Um, we will also be asking folks to pay particular attention to calling them um, to grant those clemencies to people who obviously who uh, are ser have been serving decades for violent offenses uh, as they should be included in this. Um, so thank you so much for your participation on that. If you have any other questions, you can also reach out to me, Amber Rose at curbprisonspending.org. Thank you so much, Amber. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead and wrap up a few, with a few announcements. Um, once again, if you like what you heard, please go to workers.org slash donate or to Venmo at Workers World and make a donation so we can continue to grow our audience. Uh, this is an all volunteer effort, so we would um, love any support you can give. Um, and if you are interested in joining a revolutionary socialist political party, you can also join Workers World Party or check us out at workersworld-party.org slash join. Um, and finally, our next webinar will be um, next Thursday, April 16th, on the call for a May 1st general strike and for building up working class resistance to the COVID-19 COVID capitalism. Um, join us and check out workers.org for the link to register for that. Um, once again, we really want to thank our panelists. This was a fantastic, fantastic uh, webinar, and I'm so happy that we were able to um, get the word out about all the um, good work that everyone is doing. And um, let's continue building together to take down capitalism. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good night. Good night. Good night.